Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And as an introduction to our first subject tonight, there's this. Ten years ago, no one knew me. I was part of the famous no-name defense. Then we built our reputation by being fast. Now, I don't want to lose that. I drink light beer from Miller because it doesn't fill me up, has a third less calories than a regular beer, and it tastes great. Now everyone knows me. Hey, I know you. You're uh, uh, Nick Bonacani. Uh, no, that's not it. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. Well, that was Nick Bonacani, who died recently at the age of 78 one of the great football players in the NFL, and then went on to have several other careers, most notably as a spokesman and fundraiser for brain and spinal cord injuries caused by football. He was a nice Italian Catholic boy out of Springfield, Massachusetts, Springfield Cathedral High School, three-sport athlete, went on to Notre Dame. He became a great linebacker there in the early 60s, was a second-team All-American in 1961, problem was, most people thought he was too small for the NFL in the early 60s. He was only 5'11", about 220, which wouldn't cut it as a linebacker in the NFL in those days. But, fortunately for him, the AFL had been formed, and he was drafted 13th round by the hometown Boston Patriots. In the AFL, even though he was small, he had three things going for him. He was very smart, he was very fast, and he was tenacious. In the 10 years of the AFL, he was one of the greatest linebackers ever. And ironically, he was traded to the Miami Dolphins when the leagues merged, and he became the middle linebacker for the Dolphins in the great teams of the early 70s. Those teams had Bob Greasy, Larry Little, Paul Warfield, Larry Zonk, and Murky Morse on offense. But as the Miller Lite commercial alluded to, the key to those teams was the no-name defense headed up by middle linebacker Nick Bonacanti. No-name defense, by the way, was coined by Tom Landry. They played in three straight Super Bowls, lost to Landry's Cowboys in 71, then won in 72 and 73. And, of course, the 72 team was the legendary undefeated 17-0 team. And as I said, Nick Bonacanti was the key to it. He'd fly around the field making great plays all the time. He and Coach Dan Shula didn't always see eye-to-eye, but they respected each other immensely. He's in the Miami Dolphins' on a roll as one of their greatest players. He's in the New England Patriots Hall of Fame, and in 2001 he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Besides doing those Miller Lite commercials, he became a lawyer, and he also became a broadcaster for the NFL. But his life was completely changed by two events. In 1985, his son Mark was playing football for the Citadel when he made a tackle and suffered a severe upper cervical spinal injury, rendering him quadriplegic. Nick Bonacani became a tireless crusader for the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, which is a spinal cord injury research center and center of excellence at the University of Miami School of Medicine. It's among the top research centers for spinal cord injury in the world. He not only helped found the center, but he raised over $500 million for it, and it funds fellows for neurologic research. The drive in front of the center has been renamed Bonacanti Drive. The other event that changed Nick Bonacanti's life was that gradually, over the last 15 years, he himself developed neurologic problems, specifically chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the condition that's been linked to head trauma in football. His play was profiled in Sports Illustrated a couple of years ago, and it was pretty sad, and it was especially sad noting that a number of other players on the 72 Dolphins either suffered from or died from chronic traumatic encephalopathy or some related clinical variant of it. Earl Morrill, Jim Kick, Bill Stanfill, all those guys had neurological and brain damage. You know, Nick Bonacani was a very smart lawyer before this set in, and for a while there, during the early phases of the disease, he was very critical of the NFL and the NFL $1 billion settlement for CTE. So Nick Bonacani has a complicated history with football. On top of that, for a while in his post-football career, he was a lawyer for U.S. Tobacco, and his father died of lung cancer. So that's another ironic tragedy that befell Nick Bonacanti. It's a terrible story of a great football player and a truly talented guy. We're going to move on to another NFL grade with sort of a sad story. Cliff Branch, who died recently at the age of 71. Cliff Branch was one of the absolutely great receivers in the NFL for the Oakland and Los Angeles Raiders from 1972 to 1986. He was the embodiment of the deep threat. He was a world-class sprinter at the University of Colorado 
and he was one of the few sprinters who turned into a really good wide receiver. He played his entire career with the Raiders. Part of his career was with Daryl LaMonica, the Mad Bomber. At the end of his career, he was with Jim Plunkett, who could throw deep. But the main body of his work was done with the snake, Kenny Stabler, whose podcast we've done. The snake did a lot of business with his Hall of Fame receiver, Fred Bolitnikoff, on one side, and Cliff Branch keeping the defense honest on the other side. Basically, no one could guard Cliff Branch because of his speed. He was an All-Pro several times. He won three Super Bowls with the Raiders, 79, 81, and 84. In fact, he held a bunch of playoff receiving records until Jerry Rice broke them all. Let's just say there were few deep threats in the history of football. As good as Cliff Branch, he was a semifinalist for the Hall of Fame. People told him he would get into the Hall of Fame, but he died before that happened. And my personal opinion is he should be in the Hall of Fame. Here's a little video that talks about it. Cliff Branch. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say Cliff Branch? Speed. 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 Total speed. As they too found that on the gridiron highway, speed does kill. I think Cliff Branch was a game-changing kind of receiver. He was a guy that didn't catch an extremely high volume of passes. But for a team like the Raiders, who relied really on the vertical game, I mean, they were a deep ball throwing team, and you needed uh, a big deep ball threat. I mean, Branch was that's exactly what he was. Cliff Branch was a deep threat before there were real deep threats. In an era where you didn't throw deep, and you didn't try to stretch the defense, only the Raiders did. Cliff Branch was one of the first guys who could go out there and just stretch the defense. He was one of the guys that they feared the most. I know Al Davis always talked about that the player that the defenses always fear the most was Cliff Branch. see how good he was and, and what an impact he had on one of the game's most dynamic offenses. I think you can make a very strong case for him as a Hall of Famer. Branch averaged an astonishing 24.2 yards per catch and 79 receiving yards per game in 1976. But it was another number that made him a trendsetter amongst his peers. He wasn't just a blazer running, but he was a trailblazer because he wore that 21. 21, cool. The minute they see that 2-1, oh, it's Cliff Branch. Like, he had that identifiable of a number. It's like a 17 for Harold Carmichael, double zero for Ken Burrow. To me, it's iconic. I don't think that enough receivers wear number 21 or anything like that. I think that's a rule that needs to be changed in the NFL. But he definitely needs to be in it. He was there with two different quarterbacks, catching all those touchdowns, huge part of those teams. Throwing a deep bomb, going to Branch against Livers. Livers knocks it down. Why does Swan make it and branches out? It's your fault. It's NFL Films' fault. Because you've shown those Lynn Swan catches from Super Bowl X how many times? Cliff Branch, though, was a more consistent player than Lynn Swan, and he was a scarier player, I guarantee you, to defensive backs than Lynn Swan. I think that's a fair comparison when you look at Cliff Branch and Lance Swan. And if Lance Swan still got in with John Starwood being really a better receiver, then why shouldn't Cliff Branch have a legitimate argument to get in, even though Fred Politnikoff is on the other side? And Cliff Branch has championships as well. It's a good argument. Stump me there a little bit. There. That's, that's, a, that's a good comparison, eh? And maybe Cliff Branch gets in. Well, he didn't get in before he died, and it's really sad when a guy who should be in the Hall of Fame doesn't get in before he dies. I'll just tell you one thing. If you were a defense and Stabler was sending Branch deep, you knew you were in trouble. We're going to leave football now and enter the movies with D.A. Pegbacker, who died recently at the age of 94. It's another guy who didn't get the credit he deserves. He was an extremely influential filmmaker, but despite having a list of impressive films that he directed, he never won an Academy Award. In fact, he was only nominated for one Academy Award, and that was for The War Room, which is a story of the Clinton candidacy. 
and that wasn't even his best film. Now, a couple of years ago, he did win an honorary Oscar, so we'll give him that. But D.A. Pennybacker, you'd think that he comes from the coast because he did so much stuff in California and in New York, but in reality, he was born right here in Evanston, Illinois. In fact, he was a distant relative of another movie guy from Evanston, Illinois. Anybody want to guess? That's right, Marlon Brando. For my money, D.A. Pennybacker's best film was Monterey Pop, which I think might be the best documentary about rock and roll ever made. To me, it's either that or Scorsese's The Last Waltz. Both are better than Woodstock. Although Pennebacher did an excellent film in 1960 about the Wisconsin Democratic primary between John Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. Neither of those is his best known film. His best known film was Don't Look Back, which is about Bob Dylan. We talked about it a little bit years back when we did the Horace Judson podcast, what a jerk Bob Dylan was in the film. But that's probably the one most people think of when they think of D.A. Pennebacher. Here's the website IndieWire on D.A. Pennebacher. D.A. Pennebacher, the Academy Award nominated director of 60 documentaries, whose career encompassed more than 50 years, has died at the age of 94. A seminal figure of the cinema verite movement, Pennebacher helmed such nonfiction masterpieces as Monterey Pop, The War Room, and Bob Dylan Don't Look Back, bringing his canny eye upon everything from 1960s counterculture to the urgent political issues of the day. In tribute to the late filmmaker, IndieWire has assembled five must-see films from Pennebacher's prolific catalog. First is Primary from 1960. Pennebacher edited Robert Drew's groundbreaking 1960 Primary, which plunges us into the 1960 Wisconsin primary election face-off between John F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey as they vie for the presidency. With its handheld camera work and intimate proximity to its subjects, this was a groundbreaking moment for documentary film, and Pennebacher's behind-the-scenes role in crafting a narrative out of the footage was key to unlocking the storytelling potential of the nonfiction format. The second is 1967's Bob Dylan Don't Look Back. Covering folk iconoclast Bob Dylan's 1965 tour of England, Don't Look Back offers an unprecedented look at Dylan and his cohorts with appearances from beat poet Allen Ginsberg, folk legend and Dylan's ex Joan Baez, Donovan, and Marianne Faithful. In addition to knockout concert sequences, the film also presents a candid glimpse into Dylan's torturous breakup with Baez. The now iconic opening sequence in which Dylan tosses out cue cards featuring the lyrics of subterranean homesick blues while Ginsburg lingers in the background, has been cited as the first real music video. The third is 1968's Monterey Pop. For his 1968 film, Pennebacher documented the epic Monterey International Pop Music Festival of 1967, featuring the likes of such marquee music legends as Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin, The Who, Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, Otis Redding, Ravi Shankar, Eric Burden and the Animals, and the Mamas and the Papas. Shot on 16mm, the film's verite sensibility is buoyed by camera operators Richard Leacock and Albert Mazels, both of whom went on to make documentaries of their own. I'll just add that a couple years back we did the Albert Mazels podcast, to which I refer you to. The fourth is the 1993 film The War Room. Pennebacher and Hegedus received an Academy Award nomination for this documentary deep dive into the 1992 presidential campaign of Bill Clinton. The film follows political commentator James Carville and ABC News' George Stephanopoulos beginning at Clinton's New Hampshire primary to paint a picture of the various scandals that emerged from Clinton's candidacy, from his resounding Read My Lips, No New Taxes proclamation to his much-publicized affair with model Jennifer Flowers. George Clooney said the movie inspired his 2011 political thriller, The Ides of March, and it was lovingly spoofed in an episode of IFC's Documentary Now series. The final one is The Kings of Pastry from 2009. Pennebacher and Hegedus collaborated for this delicate portrait of the world's finest pastry chefs, tracking the Meilleur Ouvrier de France competition alongside Jacques Pefier, founder of the French Pastry School in Chicago, as he races to outdo 15 other culinary masters. This late period work from the filmmaking duo showcased the lighter side of their filmmaking talent, but it also provided a cinematic alternative to the reality show cooking genre by focusing on its subjects in their industry as much as the food they produce. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tips. As a final tribute to D.A. Pennebacher, we could have taken something from Don't Look Back, but I prefer to take something from Monterey Pop and the guy that made a star, Otis Redding. How about his cover of Satisfaction? Jump again! Satisfied.
I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to cry, I'm trying.